Welcome back to chapter 6. In the previous lecture video and all of the examples that went with it, we've covered the main problem type out of chapter 6. What we have left is this video, which covers some kind of key concepts, not just about circular motion, but about how we experience forces in a more general way. And then we do have an additional not separate problem type, but an additional equation that is applied to circular motion problems when we explore Newton's law of gravity in a more universal way. So that's what's coming up um, for the remaining part of the chapter. Uh, we don't cover section 6.6, .6, satellites and Kepler's laws, although that is in the appendix that has been mentioned once before and will be mentioned several times um, through this video and the next one. So this section is called Fictitious Forces and Non-Inertial Frames. Very fancy uh, science terms to describe the fact that if we are in a moving frame of reference, the things we experience may not match what our physics equations seem to be telling us. Some of the simplest examples uh, don't even involve circular motion. We just think about the fact that if we're driving in a car, the stuff we've been learning about how cars speeding up and slowing down work from chapter two and then forces in chapter four aren't actually what we feel when we're in that situation. If we're in a car and we slam really hard on the brakes, we feel like we're thrown forward. Right? But if we think about what our physics equation is telling us, that car is slowing down and the acceleration is um, backwards from what we suddenly feel when we are thrown, up, thrown against the um, seatbelt. Or think about what happens when you are waiting at a stoplight and it's been red forever and you really want to get where you're going and as soon as it turns green, you floor it. You put the gas pedal down as quick as you can you feel pressed back into your seat, like there's some force acting backwards, when our physics equations would tell us that because we're accelerating forward, the net force is forward. So what's this disconnect between what we feel and what our equations are telling us? Well, the equations are describing the overall car. The car does accelerate forward, but your body is trying to stay put. That's the idea of inertia, staying put at the stoplight example or continuing in the straight line you were trying to do in the um, slamming on the brakes example. So if we think about the stoplight that has suddenly turned green, as soon as we slam on the gas pedal, we start to accelerate forward. The overall force is forward. But because our body is trying to stay still, we feel like we're being pushed as we move forward based on our physics equations and understanding. Because you're in that moving car, it is hard to recognize that the physics equations are describing the, the view from outside that car. Same idea if you slam on the brakes or if you think about a situation where you're in a train or a bus that was going along at a steady pace and then you weren't paying attention, you were on your phone maybe, and the driver gets to a stop um, stoplight and puts on the brakes, you feel thrown forward because your body was trying to continue to move in a constant um, forward rate and your entire frame of reference around you, the bus or train, has caused an acceleration to slow you down. And so you feel thrown forward as that happens. This disconnect comes from being inside the moving reference frame compared to being outside it and writing equations about the train or bus. So now we get to the point of connecting this to circular motion. We have to fight some misconceptions and confusion in our heads because of this idea of if we are on a um, merry-go-round, we feel like we're constantly being pulled off of it. That feeling is because what you're really, you know, what your body's really trying to do is to go in a straight line 
and there is a force that is preventing that. So the net force absolutely points towards the center of the circle, like we have described in the first two lecture videos, but we feel like we're being pushed outwards. This is where the term centrifugal force comes in. Scientists, physicists hate that term. It's not a real force. We, especially in Physics 125, hate that term. Because all it is doing is trying to describe the fact that if you are in a moving reference frame, it seems like all of a sudden stuff is being pushed sideways in a way that you weren't, that you can't otherwise explain. It's a made-up explanation that, that helps us come up with why things move the way they do when the frame itself is moving. This example is a good one because I'm sure this has happened to you, although hopefully you are all wise enough not to put an open mug of coffee on your dashboard. But if you're driving in your car and you go around a curve, you and your car and your phone, which looks like a bar of soap, I don't know, and the coffee are all trying to go in a straight line, but the car is saying, nope, we have to go around the bend. What that looks like inside the car is all of a sudden stuff seems to move sideways. Or imagine that you are, have been a passenger in a car, three people in the back seat, we've all been there, and when we go around the curve, there are now three people that are all squished into that one poor person on the wrong side of the car, and again, this is because we were trying to move in a straight line and the car is saying, nope, we actually have to go off to the side. So I need to make sure we recognize that this is not a new force to put into free body diagrams or anything like that. It is a way to better understand what we really meant by inertia back at the start of chapter four and what happens when we think about being inside the moving frame of reference compared to standing on the side of the road doing physics equations about the person in the moving reference frame. There's an amusement park ride called the Rotor Ride that dates back to the 1940s through 60s. Um, you may have ridden in something similar. The Rotor Ride really isn't around anymore. Um, there's safer, uh, possibly less exciting versions of it. And there is a full problem, number problem, worked out in the appendix slides that helps us understand that this ride, and the very first link here, I strongly encourage you to watch it. it. It shows a French version of the rotor ride. This ride is one that you stand up against the wall when it's not moving, and then as it speeds up faster and faster, they drop the floor out from under you. And yet you don't fall, you actually feel like you're being pressed up against the wall. Our physics equations tell us that the net force is pointing towards the center, but that net force is the wall behind you keeping you moving in a circle. So I highly encourage you, all of these links are clickable in the posted slides on Blackboard. I highly encourage you to watch each of these examples. The first two are small clips, you watch them all the way through. The second one is a um, longer video that we have a starting point where um, two men are talking about a dry ice puck. Uh, as soon as they finish that discussion, you don't have to keep watching. It's just for the dry ice section of it. But it really does help us understand the difference between being in a moving frame of reference and not. There's a couple of other forces that um, you may have heard of in um, larger terms outside of this class. The Coriolis force is one of these. It's another situation where it is a force that um, in most of the discussion of it, not in this course, but just in general, it tends to be on large scales, earth-wide scales. So there's a video here um, that you're welcome to, to click on and watch if you're interested, um, is that... It is because if we think about the Earth rotating, that is a moving reference frame. And so when we are thinking about large scale motions where that can have an effect, we start to see this imaginary force, just like centrifugal force isn't real, the Coriolis force itself isn't real, 
but it helps us understand the motions that we see as we sit and spin around on the earth as well. So there's plenty more slides in the appendix for this particular section, thinking about the Coriolis force in general. So I highly recommend that you read through those. And I do want to make sure that we recognize that section 6.4, this whole lecture video, has been helping us to make some connections to our real world experiences and what our physics equations have been saying. But there wasn't any new equations brought up here. No new problem types come out of this particular section of the book. So that's it for this section. The next one's going to be talking about the universal law of gravitation. And so I will see you in that next video.